So ladies and gentlemen, uh, honored guests, it's a great pleasure to see uh, so many here and I hope uh, that you will enjoy today's program. We have the honor to uh, welcome His Excellency uh, the Ambassador uh, Kui Zongyou from, uh, from China. And uh, <coughs> I will first ask the Ambassador to uh, say a few words. He will also uh, take some questions after his statement. And after that, uh, I will have the pleasure to welcome uh, a panel uh, to discuss the various issues concerning China. Uh, the panel will consist of Dr. Jian Dan, uh, Ms. Uh, Catherine Elgin, and Ms. Mr. Tim Vivi. I will explain more about these uh, people, or these participants later. First of all, I'd simply like to start this seminar by asking the ambassador to come to the classroom and then give his statement or speech, and then we'll continue from there. So, again, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, ambassador, for participating. <laughs> 要了解中日关系走向全中国人民曾经受益中国保持社会政治稳定甚至被侵略被奴役的痛苦将都将都等各种法华分裂势力而不是传到别人家里去抢东西共同为世界的和平发展与安全做出应有的贡献因此我们要相互尊重 
确立了确立了习近平新时代中国特色社会思想，规划了和本世纪中叶和中国建设中的呃社会主义现代化强国的宏伟目标。为此，中国将全面深化各领域改革，进一步扩大对外开放，向世界各国各地区全方位开放，而且改革不停动，开放不止步。正在举办的首届国际进口博览会，就是中国扩大，就是中国坚持扩大开放的正正先势和行动。正如我在演演讲开头所说，中国改革开放其使全世界受益，中国进一步深化改革、扩大开放，一定会使全世界更多受益。中国进一步深化改革、扩大开放，一定会实现。我们致力于。我们致力于健全社会民主法治，保障和促进人权，致力于让全中国人民过上美好生活。中国社会政治将更加稳定，经济将更加繁荣。但无论中国发展到什么程度，比如将来发展到人均 GDP 达到瑞典现在这样的超过五万美元的程度，同样坚持走和平发展道路，同样奉行和平的外交政策，致力于构建人类命运共同体，而不是去干涉他国内政、侵略他国。充满争霸，在人类数千年的历史发展进程中，任何一个侵略他国、奴役他国、霸占他国的帝国，最终都是以失败和瓦解而告终。这这就是历史给予我们的教训，更是启启示。中方高度重视发展中欧关系，关于如何进一步发展中欧关系，我更愿意听取大家的想法和建议。Thank you very much. Thank you. Vice uh, Chairman of uh, an association called the BRICS, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, Executive Group in Sweden, which is working for promoting and educating people to understand the importance of the Belt and Road as an international development uh, perspective. I would like to uh, to ask uh, Ambassador. Uh, that the rapid development of China in the last 50 years where when it was opened up has led to a dramatic elimination of poverty of 700 million people who have been raised out of the level of poverty and I understand that China's intention is to eliminate that completely within the coming years but I but that process has been based on industrialization, a rapid industrialization, modernization of technology infrastructure. And I think that somehow the European countries have tended to lose sight of that. Uh, my question is, would it not benefit the basis for the relationship between Europe, Sweden, and China if Sweden would more openly revive the industrialization process which actually led Sweden out of poverty more than a hundred years ago. Now,现在中国剩下的三句话人口 
，但是我看到，呃，人线真的修，跨上越岭的高速，呃，高速修顺以后，从丽江著名的丽江到香港啊，只要四十分钟。没在一路是中国实现全球化，呃，经济全球化的趋势提出的这个这个合作合作产业。它的本意和第一件要做的事，就是把欧亚大陆通过呃基础设施建设连接起来。呃，一方面，呃，促进中国跟其他国家的呃各领域务实合作，同时也要使欧亚大陆，比如中亚那些欠发达地区，更发达的欧亚大陆连接起来，共同发展。实际上，要加强基础设施建设来呃脱贫脱贫的发展，也是中国向包括瑞典在内的西方发达国家学习。我记得我上大八十年代初期上大学的时候，我学的是国际政治，我了解到瑞典是世界上发展当时最成功的国家之一。那么其中一条就是瑞典拥有世界上最发达的呃基础设施，包括呃连接前轨的高速公路。但是我确实也跟瑞方朋友讨论的时候，我也提到，呃，瑞典过去呃世界领先的基础设施，那么几十年后确实也面临面临一个更新和纯洁的问题。比如我到哥德堡去出差，呃，坐那个火车，坦白的讲，呃，不太适应。呃，这两天看了快报上有一位记者到中国采访，发了一个报道，呃，他呃坐着中国高铁，呃，描绘了描述了报道了中国高铁的发展情况。我我建议瑞方朋友也去看一下。我也知道瑞典政府讨论修高铁有有好几年了，呃，相信瑞典政府也能呃从。包括中国在内的世界世界其他国家，现这个呃现发展现代现代化的这个设施方面，呃，能得到一些启示。Thank you, uh, my name is uh, Victoria, and I'm Lucy Cross. I work uh, as a geopolitical uh, analyst. Uh, Your Excellency, I am happy to hear, and I would like to congratulate you to lifting the. So many of your people out of um, poverty, which is of course a fantastic thing to do. Uh, we've been listening to your uh, description of the reform program, and uh, from the uh, relation point of view between China and Europe in general, Sweden in, in particular, I would, would very much like to hear a little bit about the, the environmental and the climate part of your reform program. Um, we, of course, we need the infrastructure, as you describe it. We also have a lot of young people here that are, I'm, I'm sure, are interested in the in the virtual infrastructure. Uh, but from our side, we are also a little bit concerned about your size, your development, and how do you include environmental matters? Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Your Excellency, my name is Pia Svensson, and I'm a registered nurse in Sweden. I'm really happy to hear that the people in China have been able to get a better life. As a nurse, I have heard a lot of reports from China about the organ harvesting of um, people, those uh, con prisoners of conscience, and that is ongoing issue since many, many years. I went to a meeting with doctors at Houdinge Hospital for two years ago, where David Kilgore and David Mehta, who have been investigation, the organ harvesting uh, of, from the prisoners of conscience, which are Christian people, Uyghur people, Tibetan people, even people who practice meditation Falun Gong, which is the largest group. So I'm just interested in to know how, I know China has been denying these facts all the time, that it doesn't happen, but there are many, many reports about this. I think it's an important issue and question because China is a big country and has a wonderful culture and the old culture is so, is so special. And I love the old culture. I even study Chinese right now because I love the, this language. But I wish that change can change and that we can, development can be better on the issue of the prisoners and their fate also and what happens in China on, the, on that region. Thank you. Good afternoon, Excellency. I'm Tamia And my concern is uh, the, the free trade that is threatened. Uh, I know that both the EU and China are uh, trying to find ways to tackle this issue. Could you speak up a bit? So we... I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the free trade that is being threatened by Mr. Trump's policies 
And this is a threat that is shared by both China and the EU. And it would be interesting to hear what um, His Excellency uh, think about this and uh, how to come closer with the EU to, to maybe create another trade arena. Thank you. Uh 结合起来甚至没有正式的发展来的把把经济发展在同时也保护环境作为一个一一体那么到二零一二年十一月份中共十八大刚开的时候那么在筹备十八大刚开的时候确定中国进一步发展的议程的时候那么包括中国领导层中
，其他国家搞自由贸易，招致英国什么炮舰打开中国大陆，是吧？对，所以邓小平当初搞改革开放的时候，其中一个重要的理由就是，中国如果不开饭，中国如果落后就要挨打；中国如果不向世界开饭，同样也要挨打。那打开大门，欢迎呃外国到中国来做贸易。是不是呢？我们也愿意组织国盟跟其他国家去做贸易。那么，一八四零年，西方列强用枪炮逼着我们开展自由贸易。那么我们现在吸取了教训，我们愿意主动的从开展自由贸易，从世界各国上去。现在又有人要反，又有人反对。呃，中国愿意跟呃，正是为了为了顺应全球化的需要，顺应自由贸易发展的需要。中国愿意跟各主要经济体，呃呃，现在现有呃贸易现有合作的基础之上，签署自由自呃自贸协议。那么呃，相信欧洲、欧盟也能够在坚持自由贸易的基础之上，与中国相相向而行。中欧共同的通过坚持自由贸易，坚持这个呃自由贸易，呃，坚持扩大。呃，自由贸易能够为世界的、为世界贸易的发展、为经济的发展共同做出贡献。Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you very much. <coughs> Ambassador, you have already been very generous with your time, but I wonder if you can take one final question. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, it's really nice to meet you uh, in person. It's first time for me. Uh, my name is Jamyal. I'm a president of Tibetan community in Sweden. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, dialogue is very important. I really love it to hear it. And I have a question. Uh, it's uh, uncomfortable to speak in the mic. I have a question. Why there is no dialogue in between Tibet and China? Uh, we are uh, seeking for genuine autonomy and middle way approach. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, you you may not know about this. Uh, 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 at least ten years ago, the Chinese government uh, invited the Chinese government to the Chinese government to have a meeting. 放弃独立，但是直到现在还没有，我们还我至少我本人还没见到达赖集团，呃，真正的向世界宣布放弃独立，接受中央政府领导这样的意愿。我也经常听到，呃，达赖集团的一些呃负责人说，这个中赞关系如何处理中赞关系？我坦率的跟你讲，中国这个提法是不对的。中赞，中国，呃，实际上就是中国中央政府跟达赖地呃自治政府之间的关系。只是谈到自治，呃，现在，呃，西藏的西藏自治区一直是实行高度自治，西藏自治区人民政府呃自治区政府主席是,是赞，西藏各级政府的各级政府，包括自治区政府。在下一届政府的一把手都是赞，这是呃西藏自治区高度自治的一个最根本的体现，也就是西西藏高度自自治不存在政府的问题。实际上，一六年夏志阳国和夫人一起呃到呃自费到青海湖去旅游，给我们当导游，呃，给我们呃饭店里给我们呃这个。去的那个我们吃饭的饭店，都是都是赞，他们的生活呃呃很很很很稳定，很幸福。有机会建议这个呃在座的朋友都到都到这个藏区，中国的呃这个青海、西藏去看看。刚刚在日内瓦召开了人权会展，中国政政府中国政府代表呃提出针对宣布了中国呃开放。这个这个，等一下，新政的就是，呃，除了你们自愿去旅游以外，中国政府还会更多的邀请国外愿意去的人去参观访问西藏。
实际上我前不久也向瑞典朋友们发出了邀请，如果哪位瑞典朋友愿意关注西藏，愿意了解西藏，欢迎到西藏去看，自己欢迎亲自到西藏去看一看一。Thank you very much.、Uh, I think we have expanded your time, and、uh, we would like to thank you very much for、uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And、um, let's give the ambassador a warm welcome. We will now move to the、um, panelists, and I would like to invite the、um, the panelists、uh, to the table. So let me introduce、um, the three panelists. We have、uh, Dr. Jian Zhang, who is the associate professor and deputy head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, Australia. Then we have、uh, Miss Catherine Elgin, a PhD candidate in Security Studies at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and a visiting fellow at ISTP.、Uh, Dr. Jiang is also a visiting fellow at the ISTP. Then we have、uh, Mr. Tim Rilly,、uh, analyst at the Swedish Institute for, of International Affairs. You're all very welcome to、uh, to this. Uh, seminar, and、uh, let me、uh, begin by asking you a question to all of you:、um, the relationship between Europe and, and, and China. Is there anything for the Europeans to worry about in this relationship?、Uh, there have been some debates about Chinese investments and so forth.、Uh, do you think that、uh, we are on the right course, or is there something that is disturbing you in, in, in that relationship? Maybe we can start with Dr. Chen. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Alas, and it's、uh, actually a great pleasure and、uh, actually honor to、uh, join His Excellency Ambassador Gui and my panel、uh, colleagues to talk about、uh, that China-Europe relationship, and which is a relationship of growing importance at both the bilateral level and the global level. And in response to the question, and whether there is any、uh, thing which Europe should concern about China, and、uh, actually do not want to say whether Europe should concern about China or not, but I just want to make a quick comment on why Europe and concerned about China's you know、uh, rise. I think there are there are there are two significant factors which affect.、Uh, Uh, Europe's, you know,、uh, the the bilateral relationship. The first one is that the perception gap, and I see there is considerable perception and between China and Europe on the nature and activity of each other's policy, and also on the relationship, and that difference in perception and actually is a.、Uh, Cause of the you know problems and conflicts in the relationship, and、uh, for example,、uh, for many、uh, as ambassador, you know, already mentioned that there is concerns about China's growing assertiveness in its foreign policy, especially since twenty twelve, and but many people in China and、uh, genuinely believe, and what China did is to defend its legitimate national interest. But、uh, many outside、uh, observer and、uh, also genuinely believe that that is because Chinese foreign policy is getting more assertive, if not aggressive, it's purely because China now is a much stronger power. So that、uh, difference in perceptions and often caused the you know the 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 conflict and、uh, tensions in the relationship. But.、Uh, What I want to say is that the 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 perception, the difference in the、uh, perceptions between China and outside the world、uh, is actually not as many people commented as a misperception, but rather it's a true perception on both side. But the gap and、uh, is actually a significant issue which cause problem in the bilateral relationship. So in that case, what I think is that for Ah,、uh, both China and、uh, European country to consider is that、uh, to recognize the significant difference in perceptions, and to accept that the perception is actually caused、uh, not only 
and by lack of mutual understanding, but perhaps by some fundamental difference in values, interest, and political system. And based on this difference, and to develop a realistic expectation of the bilateral relationship, to think about not just about how to develop, develop a closer relationship, but to think about how to, what kind of relationship China and Europe should develop. So in that case, if both sides get the expectation right to know the limit of the relationship, perhaps it's easy for them to deal with that uh, problems uh, happened from time to time in the bilateral relationship. I guess okay. Thank you very much. Catherine? Um, just to echo, I wanted to thank you, Lars, to thank uh, ISDP and to thank the ambassador as well for making this event possible. Um, I come at this from a slightly different angle, but I think one of the important questions to ask in response to your question is, what do we mean by Europe, right? Uh, and I can say this because I'm American, uh, but do we mean the EU? Uh, I mean EU member states, do we mean Europe as a whole continent? Do we mean individual member states? Do we mean individual countries within Europe? Uh, do we mean the 16 grouping uh, and the 16 plus one grouping? And these questions I think are really important, not only for sort of considering European policy, but also for considering the policies that China holds with regards to these different entities. And I think that perhaps we see different policies within each of these entities. And so as we go forward today, I think that's a really important question to consider. Um, beyond that, I also think that the uh, new European Union response to Belt and Road is sort of an interesting place to start. Uh, because it does a really good job, I think, of both recognizing the potential benefits that cooperation with China can bring, particularly in the Belt and Road Initiative, but also on, on sort of the dangers. So of course, cooperation with China can bring many good things. It can bring development, uh, it can bring infrastructure, it can bring peace, dialogue. On the other hand, we think we need to be careful to make sure that any cooperation within this uh, is within European values and Western values, and in a way is to sort of uphold the rules-based international order that support initiatives like transparency, responsible investments, uh, anti-corruption efforts, human rights, democracy, sustainability, all these concerns, I think we as uh, Swedes and we as Westerners really hold quite dear. So that's the danger, I think, sort of balance these very tricky, tricky scenarios. And I do think the, the Belt and Road strategy coming out of the European Union is a really good start for that. Um, and maybe we can talk more about these sorts of balance questions later, so I'll hand it up to Tim. Yeah, Tim? Yeah. Thank you, maybe uh, first for inviting me and also uh, for the honor to speak in that distinguished panel and uh, after the speech of uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, thanks. Um, I should start with saying that I speak here in my private capacity, so all I'm saying is not uh, the position of my institute or the Swedish or ministry or any other institution. Um, in my response to your question, uh, I think I can, I should echo what uh, what the other panelists have said. I think it really depends on, um, well, how to define Europe then also means which countries are we talking about. There we see different sorts of investments into different sectors. Um, we see different needs from different European countries. Um, so I think a general European answer to that question is probably quite difficult to make um, and also in, in, in I can also echo um, uh, the comments on misunderstandings and misperceptions on both sides or differences in perceptions um, this is indeed um, uh, quite crucial and I think to add on this it's partly about differences in values and perspectives and traditions I think if you've carefully listened to the speech of the ambassador, you've also noticed that he has referenced quite a lot the uh, Chinese history as a semi-colonized country. I think this is something, for example, that Europeans tend to forget. Um, this is something that I think we should respect. On the other side, I think sometimes uh, Chinese could do a better job in actually communicating um, uh, their perspectives um, uh, um, and have to take into account also I think more of the freedom of the press here in Europe and how debates are actually uh, are actually taken uh, how controversial positions can be 
that it's not if you criticize something about the Chinese government that you're anti-Chinese. So I think there are sort of differences also from, from, from awareness and from perspectives uh, here um, that create these, these differences of understanding. But also, uh, I think that particularly Europeans uh, don't take into account enough the domestic developments of China. And this is maybe something we can touch upon also uh, in the discussion here on the panel and, and uh, uh, I'm sure also with the wider audience. Because this is, I think, uh, really crucial to understand. And there, I think, we have, particularly on the European side, uh, just a lack of, of knowledge and awareness. Thank you very much. Is it fair to uh, pose a uh, follow-up question? Let me just say. Goodbye. The, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say that we carry a lot of misunderstandings about China? Do we have the wrong perception of China in, in Europe? And in, if so, what are the misperceptions? Anyone? <laughs> uh, very quickly, I actually want to clarify. Why? see the perception gap. I actually disagree with the view that uh, the problem caused by misperception. But uh, rather, and what I want to say is that the difference in perception, and the perception and might be correct on both sides, but they are very different. So, in that case, and uh, uh, well, the difference in perceptions is caused by difference in values, in interest, in history, and in culture. And they are, might not be perceived, but because different people have different view. So the important thing is to understand each other's view, to realize there is different perception, and based on this, to, to develop realistic expectation about the relationship. So managing the perception difference, and I sometimes uh, feel there is uh, a, a common view is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, enhanced, uh, you know, dialogue, uh, improve mutual understanding, mutual understanding will lead to better relationship, but sometimes like marriage, and uh, better understanding lead to, you know, disaster, you know, outcome. So in that case, uh, when the, the important thing is that uh, if people realize that uh, they have difference, and the difference is deeply rooted, and then they will develop a realistic expectation about the limits and the nature of that relationship so the relationship can be better managed rather than try to solve the perception difference and sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult. So that's what I see is that uh, uh, one of the problem and in China's relationship with Europe and in Western country in general is that uh, both sides actually has very different view on the same thing and uh, sometimes that different view are hard to reconcile because it's not based on misperception. Can I ask you a question? Actually, just to follow up. Yeah. Um, could you give us an example of one of these perception gaps? I think maybe it would help us to sort of understand exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Very quickly, South China Sea, because I came from Australia, and Australia deeply concerned about China's behavior in the South China Sea. And Australia strongly believe that China's behavior in the South China Sea, including the land reclamation, the massive land reclamation, and Australia, China's rejection of the international tribunal's ruling on the South China Sea is against, uh, is a challenge and undermining rule-based international order. That's, uh, Australia's general view and Australia won't change this. But for many people in China and for many people, you know, both the government and the general public, they strongly believe that they genuinely believe that China's action in the South China Sea is to defend Chinese territory which historically belongs to China. So in that case, there is very hard, you know, uh, where people need to understand. I, I'm not uh, saying who is right or who is wrong, but I just present that there is two different uh, perception. And uh, so in that case, unless people understand uh, the perception, then you know, there is uh, uh, to, to, to develop policy response. 
and uh, then it could better to you know manage the issue. But sometimes you know difference is difference because it's based on different uh, you know, interest and based on difference in value or difference in understanding about the history. But uh, the important thing is that to understand the difference, the true difference first, and then and try to figure out the solution. Do you have one? Yeah, I, I think quickly, I um, may disagree a little bit with both of my co-panelists here. Right? Like that. That. Yeah, good, good. Um, I'm not entirely sure that the perception gap is that big of a problem. It's always hard, of course, to understand other countries' intentions. It's hard sometimes to understand your own country's intentions. But I also think that there are sometimes facts on the ground that need to pay attention to and effects of policy that need to be attention to. So I think my concern with uh, some of the Chinese initiatives is sort of the, the effects that we see that are sort of against the values that we hold. So we look at uh, indebtedness problems, we look at lack of transparency in investments. These are things that are against our values, and we might perceive the intention as uh, something we don't like, but the, the fact is that the effects are there. Um, and so if we work together to sort of minimize these effects, that's, I think, what we want. So sometimes the talking about perceptions and the gap in perception is a way of sort of talking around the actual issues. Um, and if you're a policymaker, sort of tackling actually these, quite these, these effects themselves that are on the ground are both easier than talking about the perception differences um, and sometimes more fruitful, more tangible. Of course, these perception differences do exist in many cases. I think you see that from my own government as well. Yeah, maybe then I explained it also by uh, making it more concrete. Uh, of course, uh, it's not all about uh, different perceptions, um, and I think here uh, uh, the indication that it's also that these differences in perception also, to some extent at least, stem from differences in values, probably also in interests, and also already links different perceptions to quite stand like different differences and intentions in substance. Yes, indeed. It's not all about differences in perceptions, but at some point, I think, also thinking strategically, and when I say strategically, I mean, um, because it's a buzzword always, what is strategic? But strategic, I think, is you, you take a policy as a European, and you already try to anticipate what the Chinese response will be, and try to get the relationship, uh, the world, China, whoever, whatever the, the, the object here is, to the point where you want it to be, or at least as close as possible. And here I think that uh, there's quite widespread uh, that we see a lack of understanding in that sense, um, uh, that we don't quite understand how important domestic affairs are. And let, me, let me give you one or two examples, uh, very briefly. One is, of course, it's, it's, I absolutely subscribe to any EU policy that tries to enhance democracy anywhere around the world, by whichever means that's something we would need to discuss. But we tend to forget that once we look around China, we quite don't see a strong demand from the Chinese people for a democracy that we would call as such. And this is, a, I think, a challenge for us Europeans, for Democrats actually, that we tend to to say that we want to bring something to a country that the people that this is supposed to be for don't actually ask for. I think this whole perception that is at least widespread here in Europe that Chinese people are just too oppressed to actually protest and speak up for democracy, this is, I think, really a completely wrong take on it. You see plenty of protests in China. Um, the statistics uh, that I have in, in the back of my mind are a couple of years old, but only four or five years. I don't see that it has changed dramatically. We've seen 200,000 protests each year plus, but they're protesting for a lot, but not for democracy. And this is something that needs to make us think. I'm not saying we should give up on our value of democracy, on our commitment to it. But I think we need to at least take into account that there's a difference uh, in perception here, and this is something uh, um, that needs to be considered if we want to get, get it somewhere from a strategic point of view. 
Thank you. I, I think we will later also open up for uh, questions and comments. Um, if I may change the subject a little bit and, and follow up on the question that we had in the back on the, uh, the uh, trade policies of, of the, uh, the US president. <coughs> it, it seems that he's now threatening uh, Europe, but also Japan, for instance, with, with uh, tariffs and, and uh, uh, various methods uh, to punish Japan for what he says it perceives as unfair trade. Uh, he uses cars as, as one example, uh, and I think that the Japanese have uh, very good cars themselves, and perhaps they don't buy American cars because they think the Japanese cars are better. But do you think that um, the, the way that the US president is behaving will bring China and Europe closer together? Simply put. Obviously, dressed towards me. Um, I think there's a risk of that, yes. Um, however, I will say that I believe the president's team has recognized this, um, and especially with the uh, increasingly uh, aggressive rhetoric that the administration, particularly uh, the vice president, has picked up against China, that these sorts of uh, secondary effects the administration is really paying attention to. And I will caution, I think we have this tendency to uh, take everything that President Trump says uh, word for word, quite literally, and quite often what you actually see is that behind the scenes his administration is working quite along the status quo on any issues. On the free trade, I agree, it's not been the status quo, uh, but I do think that particularly on this question, we see members of his administration uh, trying to rail in some of the free anti-free trade rhetoric uh, to try to make sure that this exact situation that he just outlined does not happen. Um, I realize that Americans really do value our partnership with European uh, our European partners, um, and, I, and I do think that especially with the midterm elections that we just had uh, earlier this week, we might start to see a shift again towards sort of more uh, pro-trade rhetoric uh, with the de Democrats taking control of the House. I think the the language there is going to shift a little bit. Um, and it may also make some of the trade agreements that President Trump has brought in more difficult to pass. Um, for example, the, the new uh, Canada and Mexico US agreement. So I, I do think there is this worry, but I also believe that um, there are some fundamental disagreements towards trade and towards development that the European community has with China. And so I'm not sure realistically how close you would come to a real free trade agreement between these two areas. Um, values are much closer with the US. Um, uh, and I believe that we also see, sort of strategically speaking, um, that the U.S. and Europe are much closer than the EU uh, and, and China, and that's incredibly important, and that's really, really valuable. Um, then again, who knows what this president will do? Um, it's hard to tell. Many analysts have been totally off. Um, there has been an interesting suggestion that, that Europe, Europe could serve sort of as a uh, connection between the U.S. and China, and that would be a really interesting role for the Europeans to play as we sort of see the tensions between China and the U.S. ratcheting up. Perhaps this is a, a, a where some where the European Union could really step in and play the sort of moderating role as, as a go-between, both geographically and sort of in terms of, of policy. Um, so maybe that's a place where the European Union could really think about um, real progress that could be made, real positive impact. Maybe just very briefly add uh, uh, some perspective I got from, from staying in, uh, in Brussels for, for quite a while. Um, I think that quite a lot of European policymakers, at least in Brussels, uh, give it another two years. So they wait for uh, the question whether we're going to see a second Trump term. If that's going to happen, then I think um, perception in Brussels will change. Um, at least, I mean, we never know what Trump going to do. <laughs> Maybe he's also changing his, his course, then we have a new story to tell, of course. But if, if, if he walks along uh, the lines that we've seen in the past on trade, then I think uh, the EU would be willing to wait this out for two more years, but not more. If I can add a uh, I also think that the Belt and Road Initiative of the place where the US and the EU can work together. Um, and I think this is something that President Trump is really passionate about. 
So we've seen just recently uh, President Trump quietly signed a bill that created a new organization, um, a new aid organization to help private finance uh, reach foreign countries. And this was a direct response to Belton Road. Um, so the U.S. doesn't really have a comprehensive response to Belton Road Initiative the way that the European Union now does. But perhaps the EU and the U.S. work together to sort of make sure that the uh, truly possibly beneficial benefits that Belton Road could bring are sort of in line with our values and our interests. And this might be one place where the EU and the U.S. could really work together um, to sort of make sure that all of the, all of the very valuable financing that is coming from China through these initiatives bring uh, human rights, democracy, transparency, sustainability. Do you, we have uh, limited time, but I think, would it be okay with you if we take some questions and, and comments from the, uh, from the audience? Uh, and uh, maybe direct the debate uh, that way also. So I open up the, yes, please, over there. Uh, if you wait for the microphone, please. Do we have one? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hussein Askari. I'm like this gentleman, a member of the Belt and Road Executive Group for Sweden, a newly founded association here in Sweden to bring the discussion to a, a new level about the Belt and Road and China's role in world economics, which is on the economic aspect of the Belt and Road, which is very seldom discussed. Uh, usually we have many of events like this as uh, on security, on geopolitics, on human rights, on all these, but the economic aspect of what the Belt and Road implies for the world or China's own economic development and industrialization implies for the world is very seldom discussed. Now, the other aspect of this is that the criticism of China or the Belt and Road usually is, uh, and I have written many papers on this, I even uh, co-authored books on this, on the economic impact, but I have recently looked at, for example, of the so-called China debt trap for countries. Uh, and the debt trap diplomacy, the term itself, was coined by a person, a student in Harvard, uh, commissioned by the State Department to write the, the study. Uh, and he was the secretary of the deputy uh, secretary of Homeland Security of the United States. So the guy comes directly from intelligence and security issues, and he wants to discuss the economics of the Belt and Road. And I think that's wrong. What he writes in that paper, and I see this criticism usually in many newspaper articles and studies, that there is a problem of projection, which in psychology is called projection. You project your own shortcomings on your victim or on your adversary. And the projection of what being described as China's intention, which is not proven, is that it will do exactly as the colonial powers of Europe did. So we are trying to project the European colonial thinking and even the post-colonial thinking on China without understanding China's history or its own political system or philosophy. So I think there is a big problem there. So if we can't focus on the economic benefits of the Belt and Road and China's policy and stop projecting our own policies, terrible things Europe and the United States have committed in the world in the past 40, 50 years, we should stop projecting that at China because we don't really understand the Chinese philosophy or history. Thank you. Uh, now that's a good uh, basis for a debate. <laughs> Could you, would you like to comment on that? <clears throat> um. Well, I mean, certainly it's uh, quite a strange position as a European to criticize uh, other countries um, on or accusing other countries uh, of, of colonizing project. I mean, this is certainly problematic. Um, just very briefly, and then I leave all the, the hard stuff for my other panelists uh, here, is uh, I don't quite see that, what, uh, maybe you could help me then out uh, what the Belt and Road actually is. I see it as uh, uh, a nice heading. Uh, I see it as a very traditional way of, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party is doing policies, and this is to come up with an initiative that is quite flexible, that is quite open. Uh, so I don't quite see this sort of one-size-fits-all uh, model that the Belt and Road does. Um, so I think if we claim that China is doing wrongs, or if we praise China for the Belt and Road, 
we should need to look closer into specific countries, into specific projects, and then say, and then reason both our criticism or why we praise China on this. I think these general arguments, I just don't buy into that. Um, one follow-up maybe on, on uh, what my, my fellow panelists said. I don't, uh, maybe you could help me out uh, what the EU's comprehensive response to the BRI is. I don't quite see it. If you refer to the new connectivity strategy, then I'm still waiting for the budget behind it. And as long as these are kind words and no budget attached to it, I don't quite see where this is uh, heading and how important it and substantial it actually is. Uh, I, I think the comment is uh, very good and uh, uh, raised the question about how should we understand the nature of BRI. And actually, the, the Belt Road Initiative is actually uh, a complicated uh, project. And uh, it, it's very hard to generalize the nature, the consequences, uh, and the impact, uh, and the response of other countries to the BRI. And uh, it has some economic uh, you know, uh, uh, consideration, but also has some uh, political, strategic uh, uh, reasons behind it, uh, and also in different region to different country, and uh, BRI could be a very different uh, issue. So it's very hard to generalize uh, whether BRI is good or bad, and also in terms of economic uh, uh, impact, uh, definitely, and uh, uh, ERI and will bring significant economic opportunity. But for some other country, uh, BRI, if not uh, managed well, it could lead to the so-called debt trap, which, but that uh, not necessarily, and uh, because of the intention is to deliberately, co you know, create a debt trap, but uh, if it's not uh, financially managed well, and uh, it could lead to that situation. So I think when we talk about the BRI, we need to talk about more specifically about uh, what exactly the project, the country, and uh, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, rather than to generalize whether it's a grand strategy of China to do whatever, you know, have with a hidden agenda. And the, the key thing, but sometimes, uh, you know, China itself, <laughs> and uh, should be, you know, uh, uh, it's a party to blame because of the BRI and uh, uh, it's promoted too quickly and too fast without a clear, you know, uh, 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 plan or, or, you know, information which is given to other people to understand and also uh, there is some uh, question about the financial sustainability of BRI so recently, I think a number of countries and uh, already uh, recognize this. For example, Japan recently signed up on the BRI, but based on the condition of transparency and also by financial, you know, uh, uh, soundness and economic efficiency. So BRI, as long as it's environmentally. Uh, you know, uh, 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 friendly and financially sustainable and economically efficient uh, and follow international norms that Japan will support the BRI. I think the European Union's connectivity plan and recently released also had a similar approach which is uh, to talk about uh, transparency and to talk about uh, sustainability and to talk about a role-based financial project. So in that case, I would say, and uh, uh, there was no single conclusion can be made about BRI. It could be a good thing, and for some project, it could be a bad thing. It could be fail because of mis-financial management, uh, or it could be success because it meet uh, the economic opportunity of many uh, countries. So in that case, I think what I want to say is that uh, and to make, uh, to, 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 to reap the benefit of BRI and other countries and uh, better to be part of it, uh, to shape it, uh, to help it success uh, rather than to resist it. Um, 
So thank you for your comment. I think it's really helpful. And I do think it's, of course, extremely difficult to separate economic from political aims. Uh, it's the nature of, of geopolitics. It's the nature of international relations. Um, and many international scholars, of course, debate this, right? What is politics? What is economics? How do they relate? And I think that the question of what we actually mean by Belt and Road is really important. Because I think that PRC has actually done a brilliant job of, of labeling the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, just look at the way we speak about it. Right, it's, it's this potentially transformative project, and we can all agree that it's, it is potentially transformative and potentially really beneficial. But it's also everything and nothing at the same time. Right, it's 60 plus countries, maybe it's investments here and there, it's investments that were made before the 2013 announcement, it's investments made after the 2013 announcement. It's very difficult to see what the project actually is, and yet we do talk about it like this amazing transformative concrete thing. So something sort of went really well there in the advertising. Um, and I sort of nod my hat to that. Maybe we can talk offline, but I think there are reports, and Dr. Zhang referenced these, that were suggest that Belt and Road is not necessarily economically viable. Even the connectivity across the Silk Road economic belt, there's lots of questions about the train routes. Um, going across railroad is much more expensive and much more time uh, costly often than it is actually going across the sea route, at least now. Maybe that changes. But currently, the numbers just don't quite add up, especially along the Russian route. So there are questions about this economic viability. And so if there are questions about this economic viability, I think it's really hard to say then that it's just that economics. Right? So why do you continue to push if the economic questions just don't add up? That suggests that perhaps it is political. And that's an open question. We have yet to see sort of how the economics play out. But I think we can't deny that that's a question that we have to respond to, especially when we start thinking about all of the second order effects like transparency, like sustainability, like the indebtedness problem. And the fact that you have several countries recently either canceling Belt and Road agreements or resisting them or pulling out, Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, Pakistan, uh, Maldives, Kenya, I think that suggests that perhaps there is something else going on, and this is a problem that China really does face. Because Belt and Road can do a lot of great things, but if it has this perception that we need to figure out how to fix it, if you're looking at it from the Chinese perspective, I need to make sure that you do actually create these investments and these aid program projects that really do lead to sustainability. Um, that's a real big challenge the project faces currently. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> take more questions, but actually our time is up. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd simply like to uh, thank the panelists and, and thank the, uh, the audience for, for coming here and participating in this seminar. And uh, I'd like to suggest that we uh, end by giving the panelists uh, a warm hand. Thank you so much. So again, thank you for coming, and that's the end of this seminar. Thank you so much.